Coming out on a little bit of a cold day, windy. You gotta love Jesus. Go to church in the wind, or just live in West Texas. <laughs> Man, it's crazy. This weather's bipolar. Y'all notice that? Like, how you gonna be a hundred degrees one day and then like fifty the next? And you're like, gum. I mean, this weather seems like it's seen a state trooper in its rear window, but <laughs> it's good stuff, man. I uh, I want to pray before I get started today because I I. Uh, Man, I've been preaching for 29 years, and uh, yeah, isn't that awesome? I love what I do, but in 29 years, um, this may be one of the most pivotal messages I've ever preached, and so I I just want to pray that you receive what's going out today, whether you're here or whether you're online watching, because we got a great online campus. How many of you know that? Great online, because church doesn't look anything like it used to before COVID, before COVID hurt, man, you know, we was running about 2,000 people here at the worship center. I think we had about 1,200 last week. So church looks totally different than it did before. But we have people engaging online, and we are so thankful. Can we give a big hand for our online campus, man? Love those guys that do life with us online. Thankful for the moderators. But I just want to pray that the Lord would prepare our hearts. Father God, I love you today. And I'm thankful to be in your house. I'm thankful to, uh, to be used in your hand today. And Lord God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear what your word would have to say, and not only hear, but then we would carry out and, and, and do what we've been called to do, Father God, that we don't stay in a state of, of brokenness or hurt, but we move into that place of healing for ourselves so we can be about the master's business, doing what he called us to do, and, and be about what he made us to be about, Father Father, we invite the Holy Spirit to come down and soften our hearts today. Give us ears to hear, Lord, whether we're watching online or here in the service, Lord. Give us ears to hear and then a heart to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. So we are in week number three of our series on on baggage. And and the whole purpose of this series is to help us recognize that everybody here it's kind of headed on a, on a journey or a destination, but some, many of us aren't enjoying the journey called life a whole lot, not because of the destination, but because of all the baggage that we're carrying with us along the way and, and somewhere in the process. I don't know how it happens. I don't think we mean to, but we just start picking up things that really weren't ours to pick up. And we start carrying these weights around that really weren't ours to carry around. And, and then we learn how to compensate for the weight, thinking, well, this is just part of it. This is just the best that life is ever going to be. And, and, and now you're hobbling around, you know, you're, you're barely getting through the day because you're so weighted down and, and it's painful. And what I want you to know is that God never intended you to carry some of the things that you're carrying this morning. You hear what I said? God never intended for you to carry some of the things you're carrying today. And, and I believe that some of us know that we shouldn't have the weight, but rather than do anything to change it, we just learn to cope with it. We, we know we shouldn't carry it. We know we should release it. But rather than do that, we just learn to carry it and we don't change everything. And so we then, then we start self-medicating. That can, be, that can be through drugs, that can be alcohol, that can be unhealthy relationships, that could be food. I mean, there's a, du- a million different ways you can self-medicate. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and none of it hurts, and it's just, we just think it's the best it's ever going to be. But I got good news for you this morning. This whole series is about living free and traveling light. Would it be okay if God set you free this morning? Man, I think that. There's, there's somebody, no, I, don't, I just like the way it is. I don't want to be changed. I just want to, well, man, I bet you're a ton of fun and you get invited to a lot of parties. And so <laughs> today we're going to talk about what, what I think is, is 90% of, of all baggage, and that's relational baggage or relational wounds. How many of you in this room have ever had a broken, broken bone? 
Yeah, I mean, me, me too. How many of you have ever had more than 30 stitches? Okay. How many of you have ever been stabbed? Okay. How many of you have ever been shot? I, I just want to see who I don't want to sit by in church. I just, no. <laughs> Isn't that Only at the worship center do you ask those kind of questions. At the other churches in town, how many of you have fell off a skateboard? You know, you go to the worship center, how many of you have been shot? That's the church. Who shot you? My dad. I mean, we were shooting at each other, you know. We were playing around in the front yard, bless God, you know. <laughs> But, but here's, here, the reason I ask that is this. If, if you've had any kind of physical pain in your life, you know it hurts. And oftentimes it leaves a scar or it leaves a memory of that incident. You ever get stabbed, you don't forget getting stabbed. You ever get shot, you don't forget getting shot. And, and you know it happened. But, but what we also know with physical pain is that it will heal and you can get over it. Or at least that's what people tell us. But, but there's really nothing like the wound of a heart. There's nothing like the wound of the heart, and it's a far greater pain than any physical pain. And, and here's what I know after being a pastor for 28 years is that everybody in this world's been wounded somehow. Everybody in this world's been hurt somehow. And everyone has experienced some kind of relational disappointment, or maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've uh, uh, went through a, a divorce. Maybe you grew up as a kid, as a divorced parent, and, and that was a whole different thing than you ever thought it would be. Or maybe you had a, a parent that was an abusive, and, 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 but you went through something, and everybody here, what I know is, everybody has a story they can tell. And every number has a name. Every name has a story. And every story in this room matters to God. How many of you know that? Every one of them matters to God. And so what I also know is that we've all had some kind of relational pain and that very few people deal with that, that pain properly. We, we don't handle it right. And con common wisdom, everybody goes around and says, well, here's what you need, man. It just takes time. Just takes time and, and time will heal that wound and it'll go away. And what you know that if, if you've tried that prescription, you've discovered that sometimes time doesn't heal anything. Just, just because time's passed doesn't mean I got better. Here's what I know. Time doesn't heal anything, but time spent in God's presence does. But, but, but we just tell that, you know, rub some dirt on it. You'll be all right. You know, <laughs> y'all didn't grow up in that house? Where you fell down, you went in it, you told your dad, hey, your dad, shut up, boy, get, get up, roll some dirt on there, you'll be all right, roll. You're on fire and that, roll around the grass, you'll be okay, just roll around the grass. I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to have third degree burns, dad, I, you know, throw some water on me or something. No, you'll be all right, you'll be better for it, you'll have a good story to tell. <laughs> Learn how to deal with it. I mean, that's just what we tell people, man, and, and in fact, the, the Bible says that when it's undealt with, that it actually gets deeper and it actually even gets more difficult to deal with the longer you leave it not taken care of properly. So we're going to talk about some relational wounds today and we're going to look at a, a very unknown Bible story. In fact, I bet of, most of you have never heard it. You probably read over it and didn't think anything about it. But there's only six verses to this, this whole story, but it's very, very important. I, I want you to know, nothing winds up in the Bible by accident. There's 66 books, and there's 66 books for a reason. In fact, the Word says that if everything Jesus did in those three years had been recorded, that we don't even have libraries to contain that, that what he did. So and for this six verses to make it in the book is a pretty important thing. Is everybody understanding what I'm saying? It's very significant. And so nobody knows this man's name, but I guarantee you most of us know his, uh, his son's name. Everybody knows who Abraham is. We talk about Abraham. He's the father. Remember, you grew up in church? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, Father Abraham. Remember that? Now, a bunch of heathens didn't even go to Sunday school. I, I can see that. Um, I've, and then you're, the whole thing, you're doing all that business there. But everybody knows who Abraham, he, he's the, the, the father of the Jewish nation. He's the father of our faith. But very few people know about his dad. And his dad, uh, his name was uh, Terah. I don't know that I'm saying that right, but that, from West Texas, it's Terah, okay? T-E-R-A-H, Terah. There you go. 
dead gum. Anyway, so the Bible thought it was so significant to give us this hidden story that it actually teaches us something very important about emotional wounds or relational wounds. It's found in Genesis chapter 11, and it says this. This is the account of Terah. In other words, this is his life. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot, While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans and the land of his birth. Now, I want to stop there and tell you this. The Bible was telling us that the father was still alive. So obviously, this son passing was a premature death. We know that he was old enough to have his own kids, but it's letting us know that either this young man died of some kind of disease that just showed up, or an accidental death, okay? Either way, this kid died prematurely. And, and, and I get, it, it's hard. My dad passed away uh, almost four years ago this April. I, I get, if I wrap my mind around it, sons burying their fathers. I, I can kind of reason that, Pastor Scott. I, I may, but to be honest with you, I find it almost inappropriate for a father to have to bury his children. I don't think that's natural. Does that make sense to anybody? It's, it's not a common thing to do. I'm going to drop down to verse 31. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Now, we don't have any reason why this happened, but I think we can imply that something caused Terah to want to leave this city. He wanted to to leave Ur. All we know, according to what we read, is that they're moving. We know that they're being called to Canaan. The Bible says they were going from Ur to Canaan, or what would be called the the nation of Israel, if you will. And and I think think we might can see, instead of maybe Abraham being the father of our faith, if you will, Abraham being the head of all this, I think if you look in here, could, could, could we might see that rather that call being on Abraham's life, could it have been on his dad's life instead? Instead of an Abraham, could it have been Terah? We, we know they are there. They experienced this terrible wound from a loss of a son. And the Bible says now they're moving. Now, now they're going from Ur to Canaan. But watch this. They get told to go from one place to another. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Catch this. They settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran, which means somewhere between Ur and Canaan, there was a city in between these two cities. I I want you to see that he he never got to the place he was supposed to get to. He got stuck in between. He got stuck in, like Michael Jackson, stuck in the middle. He got stuck in the middle there and, and, and just, but I want you to pay attention to where he gets stuck. He gets stuck in a city that has the same name as his dead son. Coincidence? I think not. And, and which it forced Terah to face his biggest relational wound because in order to get to the place that I think God was actually calling his family to be, he's got to deal with his pain. The unfortunate part about this is when he got there, the Bible says he didn't pass through. He never went to the place that he set out to go because he couldn't get over the fact that Heron's dead. And the Bible says he stops in the middle of his pain. He stops in the middle of his tragedy and he settles and the Bible says he lived 205 years and then he died he never got to the place that he set out to go because he didn't know how to deal with the baggage that was going on in his life and I wonder if there's some of us in this room that God has called us from one place to another but we haven't got to the other because we're stuck somewhere in the middle although it was something that happened way back then we're going to miss our destiny Miss our calling over something that is left undealt with. The greatest relational wound of his life. Then there are some of them that that, that are here today and you may say, well, my my divorce defines me. My, 
My, the way my dad treated me defines me. The, the, the affair I had, it defines me. The abortion, it defines me. How many times has some event happened that has completely left us paralyzed from moving past the place that we're called to be? Because we think the event defined us when God has already given you a name and a destiny. And if God gave you a name and a destiny before time even started, then how can an event derail you unless you allow it to be derailed? It didn't happen because when God said, let there be light, anything that was opposed in light, darkness had to go and light shone through. You need to realize when God speaks something, whatever he speaks has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, it's not because his word is impotent, it's because we didn't follow through. You think about it, this is bad. When God said, let there be the light, then it says darkness didn't come. It was gone and light shone. You say, well, Todd, what's so cool about that? What's so cool about that is if you go and read the whole story, is God didn't even make the sun for two to three days later. So if there is no sun, what is shining out? What, 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 what caused the light to be light if there is no source? What the source was was God's word because whatever God says has to become. My God. I'm preaching better than you're amen in. You need to understand there are some things you may not have the evidence of the sun. You may not even have the evidence of a star. But if God gave you a word, you ought to shout over that word that you've been given. It's enough to sustain you. Amen. And some people will say it defines me. But listen to me. You got paralyzed in a moment. Something happened that you didn't sign up for, but it happened. I want to give you three things I think we can learn today from terror when you have a relational wound. And here's number one. It'll keep you from your full potential. It'll keep you from your potential. You never get to the place you're supposed to go if you never deal with a relational pain in your life. In fact, what I notice, and, and I say this sincerely, I'm not trying to be funny when I say this, when, when, when people don't deal with their pain correctly, they get crazy. Think about what I'm saying. And crazy people make terrible decisions. Terror, crazy people make terrible decisions when they've been wounded. People, what are you telling me, Todd? People are making permanent life-altering decisions over something that God could just heal if you would just give them the opportunity. No emotional person ever makes a rational decision. Let me prove it to you. It's not my word. Let me give you the Bible. Psalm 73. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. In other words, I went crazy. When I didn't handle it properly, I didn't do the right things. You need to trust people who love you deeply because when you go through a hurt, you are not the smartest person. We are not the smartest per person when we've been offended or when we've been hurt. And it's just the truth. When the enemy is attacking your life or he's attacking your marriage or whatever it is, it's not really about your marriage. It's not really about your relationship with your dad. It's not about you and that person or this person. There is a bigger reason to mess you up and that is this every attack from the devil is an attack to derail you from your purpose and your destiny that God has on your life so that you get stuck in a moment he's using the marriage to stop something bigger Jesus recognized this Peter gee I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to do this and Peter says no 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 you're not and Jesus says, Satan, get behind me. In other words, I know it's Peter that is speaking, but it's the devil that's talking. See, we got to have that kind of discernment because if we don't have that kind of discernment, we may get in an argument with our spouse and think it was our spouse, but it was the devil. Y'all not hearing what I'm trying to tell you. And so now your whole house is in an uproar and you're mad at her and she's mad at you and you, who you should be mad at is hell. Because he's trying to derail your purse. And Jesus had, he had enough discernment to see. I know it's Peter standing in front of me, but it's the devil that's doing all the talking. You got to be aware. You got to be smart about those things because if not, it, it'll keep you locked up. The enemy used Heron to keep Terah from going to Canaan. Maybe we would have never sang Father Abraham. Maybe we would have been saying Father Terah. But because of what happened then, he never gets here. 
And, and we get so locked up on one thing that, that we can see it and we're kept from our potential because we never realize that every attack of the devil is to derail your purpose. Here's the second thing we can learn from Tara, and that's when we have wounds, it, de- it pollutes our other relationships. You ever been around a wounded person? Most of them are meaner than a junkyard dog or a rattlesnake. You, you're, you're loving them, and they actually love you, but they don't even know how to have a good relationship anymore because they've been messed up by the other person, and so now they're messing you up, and if you've never been messed up, maybe you're the person that's messing everybody else up. They don't even know how to receive love because love's been so broken in their life because they don't know how to receive. They don't know how to give it. When you've been wounded, you start to have a negative impact on other people if you don't get healed. And everybody in your circle will be just as mean as you are. And everybody in your circle will be as hateful as you are. Why? Because you won't go to somebody that would heal you because that would cause you to change. See, there's a reason we spend time with the people we spend time with. They're either dumbing us down or building us up. And you'll never soar with eagles as long as you're running with turkeys. The problem with most of us is we're in this, we're in this, this, this fish tank. Okay? And everybody in this tank is the same size. Got the same ideas and the same thoughts. But if you would get into a bigger tank, you could stretch and you could grow, but you can't grow in the size of that, but you can only grow to your potential to the size of the pond you're in. So if you want to grow bigger and you want to be better, then maybe you have to extend your borders past who you're running with now, and you got to tell some people, bye. Bye, Felicia. (laughs) you got to tell some, I love you, but I love him more. I can't get derailed. I can't dumb myself down to be your friend. When I know he's got better things in store for me and my family. I love you. And you can come go with me. But we can't hang out here at the campsite together no more. You can come go with me. But, but, but don't bring a sleeping bag for me no more. Because I'm not camping here. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Oh, I'm pregnant with this message. I hope you're hearing what I'm telling you. There, there are people who can't even tell people around them that they love them. Because of what it cost them the last time they told somebody they loved them. It was used against them. And now they don't even use the words because they're afraid to use the words because of what happened then. Hebrews chapter 12 says it this way. A bitter spirit is not only bad in itself, but it can also poison the lives of many others. Did you hear what I just said? It will do these three things. What three things that will hurt? And listen, that hurt will make you defensive. You think you're protecting yourself? You're actually preventing yourself from getting healed. It's not protection. It's prevention. I don't know who that word is for, but right now, what you're doing is not for your protection. It's for prevention. The second thing it does is it makes you distant. You will pull away. You will withdraw. You you, you have a fight and and, and walk away. That's the end of this. That's it. I'm done. We're not talking anymore. Like a three-year-old. Taking my ball and going home. I'm not going to play by my rules. We're not going to play my ball. That's it. I'm done. We're through talking. And, and we think if we just move away from the discussion that it'll fix it and it doesn't fix anything because we never talk about what the issue is. And, and the last thing it does, which, which is almost the opposite of what I just said, is it makes you demanding. You, you ever meet a, a real, mean, controlling person? They try to dominate and control everything. In all actuality, they're probably the most insecure person you'll ever meet. It's a spirit of insecurity in their life. And so because their life is out of control, they'll try to control you. <laughs> and it, it's insane. It happened to Tara. In Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says Abraham had to move away from his own daddy. God called him to move away from his family. Their family got fragmented because the patriarch, the head of the house, couldn't work on his issues. Everybody else got spread out. I'm talking to some spiritual heads right now. There are things that you're not doing in your house that's going to cause your family to be fragmented. And it's not your wife's fault and it's not your kid's fault. It's because you won't be man enough to step up and be the leader that God's called you to be. 
Well, that's hard. Well, yeah, it's hard. Everything, I'm, anything worth having is worth working for. We live in this whole world where we want stuff given to us or just give it to me. Just, Are you crazy? <laughs> Ain't nobody just going to give you nothing. Give you a piece of their mind. <laughs> you got to work for it. It don't just happen. You got to put effort into it. And anything worth having is worth working for. Oh, I know I'm messing a lot of y'all up because I just want to just give it to me. Like, okay. You sit on the corner and just wait there. <laughs> See what happens. Here's the third thing that'll happen when you don't have destroy. It will destroy your relationship with God. Some of the things I'm about to say, many people don't want to hear, but you need to listen because what I'm about to say in the next few minutes just may save your life today. And here's one of those things. Our relationship with people is inseparable from our relationship with God. Our relationship with people is inseparable from our relationship with God. All throughout the Bible, it says, you cannot say love God, but you don't love people. It's impossible. Be, read the book of 1 John. The whole book talks about it. The horizontal relationship will determine your vertical relationship with God. If this ain't right, this ain't ever going to be right. And some of you are wondering right now why, why you and God have never connected well. And I'm telling you, it's because God wants you to settle some of this mess out here so he can get you healed up here. Are you hear what I'm telling you? Take care of this. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. He says this. When you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Why? So that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. That's in red. It's in red. You know what it's in red? Red means Jesus said it. When you read it in black, it means Jesus said it. It either all came from him or it didn't come from him. See what I just said? I'm going to read that again because that's stout. When you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Listen, he's basically saying, you know what that scripture just said? Don't come to me until you first gone to them. Mic test, check one. My mic sounds nice, check one. <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> Get me beatboxing. <laughs> Listen, don't come to me until you first gone to them. Why, Todd? Because God knows. Why is this important? Because God knows you're going to be unable to receive what he wants to do in your life if you're not willing to extend it to other people. You can't inherit what God wants to do in you if you can't give it away to somebody else. They asked Jesus, hey, man, what's the most important law in the Bible? Jesus said, I can't give you one, but I can give you two. Love God and love people. Don't you think the world needs to hear that message right now? This crazy world needs to hear that message. Love God and love people. In other words, you can't separate it. That's why when he's teaching the disciples to pray, it shows up in the Lord's Prayer, which, Pastor Scott, honestly, the Lord's Prayer is one of the most dangerous prayers you'll ever pray if you pray that every day. One of the most dangerous. We put it on a little, little thing on the wall. We put it on the wall. We pass it by. It's the Lord's Prayer. Hallelujah. Praise God, Jesus. And we don't think about it. It's one of the most powerful prayers you'll ever pray. And, and let me show you some of it. Matthew chapter 6. Forgive us our debts. How? As we have forgiven our debtors. What you just said, God, I want you to forgive me the way I forgive everybody else. <laughs> so if you're not forgiving everybody else, you just prayed, boy. You just prayed some mess on yourself. You think it's the devil. That ain't the devil. You're cursing yourself with your own mouth because of your bad actions. Oh, I'm preaching better than your amen. It ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It's you, your mouth. You ask God to do to you what you're doing to everybody else. And now you're broke, busted, and disgusted. Why? Because everybody else in your life is just like that because that's how you handle them. So you say, God, I want you to treat me the way I treat everybody else. Ugh, that's stout right there. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also against you. If that's true, and I got a newsflash for you, it's true. It's true, okay, right there? This may be one of the most important messages you ever hear because we're not just talking about getting a better marriage or getting a better you or getting a better dad or getting better brothers and sisters or whatever. This affects you and God. 
It's not just about you and it's you and God. The fact is, until we settle some of the horizontal relationship, this vertical one's not going to work so well. The good news is the God we serve specializes in healing the broken heart. So if you're here this morning and you're broke, busted, and disgusted, I got a God that can redeem you and put you back together. He can put you back together if you let him. Psalms 147, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So God wants to take away the baggage or the biblical word stronghold. He wants to take the stronghold away from you. A stronghold. If you missed this in the first two weeks, let me say it again. A stronghold is something that you truly believe but is a lie. And the only way to defeat that is to change the way you think. You've got to get rid of stinking thinking. you got to take... Let me give you a scripture before I get on it. 2 Corinthians 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Now, we don't do it because everybody else is doing it. I used to tell my daddy that, hey, can I go to this party? No, you can't go to the party. Everybody going to the party. Well, I ain't everybody's daddy, but I'm yours. (laughs) Well, God just said, that's the same thing God just said. Everybody doing it. Well, not everybody because if you and me, we're not doing it. We're not doing it, okay? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish baggage, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, when you got stinking thinking, you got to take that thought captive rather than feed it. You've got a choice. Either I'm going to rebuke this and I'm going to take authority over it or I'm going to feed and I'm going to water it and I'm going to pet this and I'm going to bring it home with me. And you're like, well, the devil's after me. It's not the devil. It's you. I don't want it to be me. You give the devil too much credit sometimes. Well, the devil's after me. He's just been at my house all week. You're so important you think the devil's living at your house. <laughs> he can only be at one place at one time. God's I'm not present. He could be hey, everywhere. He, he could be everywhere. Devil can only be one place at one time. So if he's camping at your house, all he loves is hell, so there must be nothing but hell at your house. All he loves is destruction and death. So if you're telling me the devil's living at your spot, that means you've opened an opportunity and gave him a room. Rather than to take that thought captive and say the devil is a liar. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We are going to work this thing out. We're not going to just throw our hands up and say, we're not going to throw out the word divorce. We're not going to throw out the word this is the best it's ever going to be. We're going to sit down at the table. We're going to grab each other's hand and we're going to pray this thing through till we get the breakthrough. Take that thought captive. You're either holding it or it's holding you. It's one way or the other. Are you here? I don't want that responsibility. Tough. I don't want to be fat, but look. (laughs) It's just in the cards. Listen to me. You're either taking that thing captive You're either holding its hostage or you're the hostage of the enemy. You hear what? That's stout. You're either taking it prisoner or you're the prisoner. And you're footing the bill for your own jail cell. Wow. What are you preaching this series for, Todd? I'm attempting in this series to give you some new thoughts. You got to put some new thoughts in your head. You got to take the old ones out. Today's thoughts are going to be the hardest for you to accept. And many will say, I'm not ready to do that yet. But your way isn't bringing you any change or any joy. So you might want to pay attention to what the slightly overweight, seriously good looking pastor is saying. (laughs) If your way's not working, would you at least entertain what I'm about to say to you today? If you came in here with no joy, you might want to listen to what I'm saying because the joy of the Lord can be your strength and you can leave this place better than the way you came. But if you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. You want something new? Try on something new. Do something that you've never done before. So what do we do? First thing right there, reveal the hurt. 
Reveal the hurt. As long as you tuck it away, it'll never get healed. Your life would be so much better if you had somebody in your life that will actually knew what you were going through and thinking, listen, that's why community groups are so important at the worship center. That's why we don't do life alone here at the worship center. Your, 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 your sins get saved by Jesus, but according to the book of James, there is some healing that can only take place in a group of community. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. There are things that happen in community that can't happen in any other way. Jesus forgives, but he'll use people to help you get healed. You just got to be careful who your circle is because not everybody love you like you love you. Look, hey, look here. I love me some pastor. I write myself, you my favorite pastor. You the best pastor. <laughs> you my favorite preacher. I like your shoes. Okay? But not everybody loves me the way I love me. So you got to find that circle that's your ride or die. Huh? Because not everybody does that. So you, you, you can't tell your stuff to everybody because not everybody's going to help you. They're going <laughs> to get mad with you rather than rebuke you when you need to be rebuked. So you need somebody, hey, look here, hey, 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 you can't be stuck on stupid today. Well, you ain't got to be so hateful. Look, I ain't got time. I got to go to work. You call me at 758. You know I got to be at work. At eight. I got two minutes to fix you. Don't be stupid. Then after work, about like 5 o'clock when you're on the way home, girl, I just want to come and pray for you. I know today I sounded like I was a little brash. I wasn't trying to be brash. I was trying to get you hold and get you healed. And you may have taken it wrong, but there is authority in the words that I just gave you. You know I love you, right? You know I love you. Girl, you girl, hey, don't you hang up on me. You know I love you. Okay? You need that person in your life that can tell you, you don't be stuck on stupid. And you may not call them back for two or three days, but you know they love you and you love them. Somebody help me get better. Don't let me say stupid the rest of my life. Mm, Y'all not ready for me. Somebody help me get better. I need somebody to help me get better. You say, well, Pastor Todd, I, eh, I want to be a part of a group, but, but I don't, I'm not whole. I'm not well. Listen, you know what? If you want to do a community group, you know what you need? You need a living room and a bag of Doritos. <laughs> That's all you need to have a community group. And what you're going to find is when people show up for your community group, you're scared to go because you think you're the baddest person in the church. What's going to happen? You're going to go to community group, and everybody's going to start sharing. And on the way home, you're like, oh, God sent me to be a... a, 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 a. <laughs> God sent me to be a lamb. I'm a sacrificial lamb. I'm over here. They, they, this, this group's going to hell in the handbag. Thank God I came. I didn't need them. They needed me. Right? Because everybody in here's got a story. Everybody in here's got brokenness, man. And that's all you need. People, well, when I get all the way better, then, then, then I'll, I'll get in community. Or when I get all the better, I'll host one. Can I tell you, you're not going to be perfect till that which perfect has come. In other words, until the rapture happens, you're not going to be good. <laughs> you're not going to be perfect till then. And some of you are going to miss out on the best days that God has for you being stuck in a moment. Watch. Oh, man. Psalms 32, 3 says it this way. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through, all, through my groaning all the day long. This is what happens. I'm going to give you a script. This is what happens when you don't share. This is what happens when you don't let that junk out of your life. Psalms 39. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. Let me lean in here. If you refuse to deal with the hurt, this verse will become you and your anguish will increase according to what we just read. You have got to get that out. Half the battle is just letting somebody else know what you're going through, and, and, and you will continue to carry those bags until the last one. Release the people that are involved. Release the people that are involved. Forgiveness is the only way to get past it. The longer you hold on to it and think about it, you're going to start acting and looking just like the person you despise because you're consumed with them. So the very person you're bitter against is the person you're going to become. Think about what I'm trying to say. Yes, well, I can't stand them. Well, you're well on your way. Matthew 18. Then Peter came to Jesus. Peter, man, I love Peter because he's trying to pull one over on Jesus right here. Give me five minutes and I'm through. 
Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? He's trying to be slick because the Jewish law said, if you forgive him three times, then that's enough. But Peter, he's trying to impress Jesus. He said, I'm going to double it, and then I'm going to add one. Be seven. If I say seven, Pastor Scott, I should, that's, that's sanctified right there. I'm going to say seven, and Jesus is going to let me off the hook. Up to seven times, Jesus answered, said, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Why do we have to keep on? I encourage you to read the rest of chapter 18, and you will see that God is unable to do that in your heart if you can't extend it to other people. If, if, if you will really see what God has done for you, it will give you the capacity to give it away. When you know how much you've been forgiven, it's not hard to forgive others. Jesus was our role model, 1 Peter 2. When they, I love, I, I, man, I, I'm praying this scripture over my life. I wrote this message several weeks ago, and I've been praying this scripture over my life every day because this is who I want to become, and I'm not there yet. Can I just be real? I'm not there yet. Because when people say something to me, I'm just, ah. I just want to lay hands on them and not pray. I know none of y'all because y'all all saved and Christians and stuff. But there, <laughs> sometimes, bro, I just feel like. <laughs> but look what they said. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, wow, this is powerful. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That's where I want to be. I want to be, when somebody comes up against me, I just immediately begin to pray for them. Because the reason they're responding that way is because they're broken in the first place. And maybe if we take out time to find out why they're responding that way, we may be the opportunity to help them heal. Rather than to beat them up. Or to cuss them out. Can we just be honest? What are you saying? God will take care of it if you'll just give it to him. And here's, here's the last one. Once we've re- revealed our pain and released the people who hurt us, and, and remember, if the whole thing isn't about the incident, it's about derailing our purpose, then it only makes sense to do this, refocus, this, refocus on God's plan for my life. Don't let the incident stop you from the great potential that God has for you. You remember when Joseph's brother sold him into slavery in the Bible? He got a chance to get even with him, and he didn't do it, and his brothers were shocked. Can I tell you, when you don't handle people the way that they think they're going to be handled, it's going to shock them. When you show them the love of God, they're going to be shocked. Genesis chapter 50, Joseph said, am I in the place of God? You intended me to harm. And he's talking to his brothers. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish now what is being done. That's my prayer for everybody here today is what the devil meant for bad. That God would turn it around and make it good and accomplish now what is being done. In this moment, not in yesterday's, but in today's possibilities, God's got a plan for your life. Can't help where you've been, can't help what's been done, but God's got a plan. And here's what I'm asking you to do today. Write this scripture down. If you don't ever take notes, write this scripture down. Job chapter 11, verses 13 through 16. Here's what I'm asking you to do today. As your pastor, I'm going to ask you to do something. Here it is. Put in your heart, put your heart right, reach out to God, then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles, how many? All All your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. I pray that for everyone here today. I pray for everyone here today, when you put your heart right and you reach out to God, then face the world again, firm and courageous, then all your troubles will fade away. All your pain, all your hurt will begin to fade away. I believe with all my heart, God wants to heal some hearts and some lives today. You say, Todd, I I, I can't do this. Put your heart before God and he will empower you to do what you think you couldn't do. Put your heart before God, and he'll help you do what's impossible. God will give you the capacity to love the unlovable. What are you saying? I'm telling you, today's a great day to drop the baggage. But don't get stuck in a moment. Don't miss your destiny over this moment. Lot's wife only had to do one thing. 
walk. All she had to do was obey the word of the Lord. And it's, today, that's what all we got to do is obey what I've been preaching. All she had to do was walk. God had given her a place to go. There's the, the city's on fire. Everything they know is being destroyed by hellfire and brimstone. There's nothing there to go back to. But isn't it crazy that we know that the angel of the Lord said he's going to destroy the city, but I've got a place for you to go. But in the midst of going to a new destination, she couldn't get past the part of looking back. When God had already said, there's nothing for you to look back to. There's nothing back there. And, and she gets turned into a pillar of salt. God had called her to be a movement, and because she wouldn't obey, she winds up being a monument. You see, that's what some of you have done. You've, you've built an altar to worship, but you're not worshiping the Lord, you're worshiping the incident. You built an altar. You're faithful to go to the altar and rehearse the pain and rehearse the, the tragedy. But you haven't given it to the Lord. And if you're, if you're not careful, you're going to get stuck. And, and I want you to see how strong God. The Lord revealed this to me in the first service, Pastor Scott. I've never thought about this in my life. Even in her disobedience, the Word of God was so strong over what he spoke over her life that she was turned into a pillar of salt. And what does salt do? Salt purifies. Salt preserves. The Lord says, even though you disobeyed the gifts and callings are without repentance, you're still going to become. <sighs> but now you just pass by it. Everybody just passed. And now it's just a mark of what not to be when she could have been somebody you aspire to be. I... so every time I think about Lot's wife I think man I don't want to get stuck I don't want to get stuck I, I, I want to forgive I want to give away I don't want to be here I want to preserve I want people to taste and see that the Lord is good I want people to thirst for the thing that's what salt does it makes you thirsty I want to be salt and light that's what we're called to be salt and light I'm not saying that what happened to you was fair but guys, we're grown-ups, right? We're big kids. Fair's where you go get corn dogs and lemonade. Life's not fair all the time. There are things that have happened in my life that I just, man, that's not fair. Trish and I had three miscarriages. I thought, God, that's not fair. I go to the hospital and I pray for everybody else's baby and they go home with their babies and mine die. And I'm your, I'm, I'm, I'm your pastor. I'm doing what you've called me to do. All I've done is preach your word. All I've done is give you glory. All I've done is give you praise. And my babies are dying? That's not fair. And when I do get Hunter, Hunter's born three months early, weighed three pounds, has to go into NICU. I'm like, God, this is not, I, this is not fair. But now, come here, Hunter. But now I got this 20-year-old kid that stands and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has a heart for the things of God. He has a heart for the people of God. And this right here, the devil intended it for bad and God turned around and made it good. He's 20 years old. He all he knows is Pastor Todd. He doesn't know drug addict Todd. He doesn't know fornicating Todd. He doesn't know stealing Todd, thieving Todd. All he knows is my dad pursues God all the days of his life. That's all he knows. And you know why? Because I decided to give everything that was bad to the Lord and say, Lord, I refuse to carry this baggage through my life so that when my son gets 20, he doesn't have to worry about being a drug addict. When my son gets to this age, he'll make the right decisions. So I'm going to leave this bag here 
I'm going to let the relational wound go. I'm going to let all the things go. Because when you have miscarriages, and some of you know what I'm talking about, not just miscarriage, some of you could baby full term and they didn't make it. That leaves a hole in your heart that you don't have words to tell. I can tell you in tongues, but I can't tell you in English. There are some pains that happen in your life that you don't even have words for. Now, I can focus on the pain or I can focus on the healer, but I cannot focus on both. I can move ahead, I can stand still, or I can go backwards, but even staying still, I become stagnant. And I become a monument when God has called me to be something greater. And God has called everyone in this room to move past your baggage today, to let the relational thing go. You can be a victim or a victor. But you cannot be both. So I want you to bow your heads and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? And my altar workers will come. What are you saying to me today?